All right, we're going to go live here. We are going to make it happen. This is my Minecraft scripting stream talking about how I got where I am and what's going on. We're getting started about 10 minutes early today, so I'm just going to sit around and see if anybody shows up. And if anybody does, then we'll uh, we'll get moving on this. Hey, Tim! Welcome. Glad you made it. In the chat. It doesn't show up on on concurrent viewers though. What's going on here? Zero viewers. All right. Well, I don't know if you're still in here, Tim, but uh, I'm going to get moving in a few minutes here. So I just wanted to do this stream. It's been over a decade since I did uh, most of the scripting and uh, just wanted to talk about what happened and kind of what I'd hoped maybe uh, tell the story again, just kind of for the YouTube audience, I suppose. There was another guy here earlier. <laughs> you mean Air Colonel Detlef? Uh... Oh, oh, another viewer. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Bob was, was here, I guess. Well, that's okay. All right, well, I guess it's just you and me, Tim. It's going to be a very comfortable, uh, cozy little stream here. I guess we'll get started. So I guess, well, I mean, since we're here early... Yeah, Bob. Uh, since we're here early, uh, why don't you uh, let me know if there's anything you're interested in, and then uh, when you run out of interesting things to ask, then I'll just move forward with whatever it was I wanted to talk about. Unless you're here for the content, and then I'll just do it. We'll make it happen. What is the stream delay? Yeah, it's only yeah, it's only about 10, 15 seconds. It's not too bad. Cool. Oh yeah, you're over in Europe, right? Well, here we go. So, uh, the year was 2010. And uh, it was March, I think. I think I got into Minecraft right around the alpha. I don't remember what exact date that was, but um, I had started... I, I downloaded the demo. There was like a free demo version where you couldn't save the game, I think. And some of the crafting stuff, or like, there was no crafting. It was just like walking around, you can break stuff and build stuff. Um, but there wasn't any crafting. And I think that was January or February sometime. So uh, I had gotten into the, the beta or whatever. Um, it wasn't a get into the beta thing. It was just like, you could download the demo and, and anybody could do it. And I think I, I saw a like a webcomic on 3-Panel Soul about uh when there were yeah 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 before there were squid i think i saw it on three panel soul where they had made a, a comic about like dwarf fortress and and minecraft and or something and there's like this you know really blocky art style I was like oh what's this you know like this is a fun game and i think maybe they had a like a tweet about it or something in the in the blog roll below so i checked it out uh started playing and was just like astounded it was like this is amazing this is really really cool and uh i think it was around that time there were a lot of things changing in my life around that time i just gotten married um 
we were uh, finding a house, we were moving uh, to a new apartment. Um, my wife was pregnant, we we're expecting a baby. Uh, we were, it was just like a lot of stuff like around that, around that time period. And, um, I just started going to choir, I think too, at church. And so there was, a there was this kind of interesting facet to this whole story that I've never really talked about. But like when I was, when I was singing in choir, my brain was just like cogitating on the the problem of Minecraft and like, cause I could see there was a lot of potential there. And, uh, and I had played, um, I played Infiniminer, like the, the, in the inspiration to Minecraft. And, uh, and so it was like, yeah, I can see where this is going. Right. Like I can see, like, I can see the vision and you can, I don't know. I don't know if I could like, there are a lot of things that I've been fascinated with in the past that haven't gone anywhere. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be fascinated by things. So, and in this case, it did go somewhere. So anyway, so I, um, when I was, when I was singing in choir, it was like, my brain was trying to work over, like, what can I do with this tool, right? Like, this is a really neat toy. This is a really neat tool. Like, what can I, what can I do with it? Like, how can, how can I engage with it better? And, uh, so this was before there was Infinite World. This is before, oh yeah, I'm sure you're familiar, Tim. This is before there was, uh, you know, like the, the horizontally infinite world. And so the levels were just cubes or not cubes, but they were always just cubes, but they were, um, they were rectangular prism shapes. And it was just like one big block of memory. It wasn't even compressed. So you could go into the NBT file and well, so anyway, I, I guess I'll, I'll do the overview here. So let's, let's just go to that. Let's just go to the overview. So this is, if you go to mc.tryout.com, that was the that was the thing up here, MC for Minecraft, not Master of Ceremonies. Um, then you will get to this page here, and uh, or actually, I think you'll get to this page here, but we'll go over that later. So um, I'm just gonna kind of browse through here. Obviously, I'm not gonna read it word by word because that'd be dumb. Uh, you can read just fine, but uh, I'm going to try to fill in the blanks here of stuff that I didn't say on the page and kind of give you guys a little more background, I guess. Uh, so like I said, uh, three panel soul was the place I found this, I think. And, um, I was playing creative. Oh, oh, is this fixed with, do I have to zoom out a little bit? There we go. That's better. Uh, so the first thing that I did the first scripting stuff that I did was to figure out the level format and the levels in Minecraft from the very, very beginning have been NBT format. It's uh, what numerical binary tag or something. Um, and it's got 10 different tag types, I think. And I think they recently added an 11th tag type. Um, and it's like a, a way of, of encoding binary information specifically with the idea in mind of saving Minecraft files. And uh, so there's a, you know, there's a tag for a binary, uh, you know, on off. There's a tag for an integer. There's a tag for a float, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's like it's kind of like C ideas or Java ideas. Well, it's written in Java, so probably Java ideas encoded into this binary format. And it's like a reduced, simplified kind of format. Um, but the only thing you really need for Minecraft files is, yeah, yeah, the, the MBT. It's, I mean, if you've messed with Minecraft at all behind the scenes, you know, like in the back end, uh, you're familiar with MBT. Um, but the, the basically the only thing you need is the binary array tag. I think it's tag seven. I could be wrong on that, but... Um, it's just like a, a whole big long string of, of um, bytes, I think. It's the byte array. And so it says at the beginning like how long it is, and then it's just got a big old string of bytes. And for a long time, until 1.3, I think. Um, yeah, or 1.13 rather. Until 1.13, the, the byte format was just the index of the block type. So if you had a bunch of air, it was just zero, 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 zero. 
and if you had a stone, it was one, 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 one. Now it wasn't like solid ones, right? Because it's binary ones, so it's like zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, and uh, but it's like hexadecimal basically for for one. And then what was it? Grass was two, or maybe grass is one and stone is two. It's been too long. Anyway, and uh, and so for a long time it was just like that format, and so it was really easy to write a parser because you're just like. Well, I don't need to parse all the NBT data. All I need to do is is parse through the file till I get to the tag that's named blocks and then like jump over three bytes or whatever and just grab that whole chunk of data and I'm done. So that's what I did initially. I was just like, I'm not gonna write a full parser for that Minecraft save files. I'm just gonna write a parser that like searches through the binary data for that tag for that plain text tag, because it's all in all the text is ASCII text, and then uh, and then just you know jump over and like grab a whole block of data until you get to the the end tag or I forget how I did it exactly, but you know just grab all that data and now I've got all the saved data right and then I can search through that and find sequences of blocks. That was the first thing I tried. I was like, okay, well I'm gonna find like sequences of blocks and then see if I can change the sequences of blocks. And when I got that working, it was so incredible. It was just like, whoa, it actually works. Like this is so cool. And uh, so I geeked out about that for, you know, a couple hours or whatever. And then I was like, okay, but like, this is fun. But really what I wanted to do was splice files together because there are these cool, um, in the in the alpha of Minecraft, and this is something that I feel like was like a missed opportunity. It was, they never really got back to it. And there's so many things they never really got back to. But um, there was the cloud levels, the levels that, that had the Perlin noise without the vertical gradient added to it. So it was just Perl and noise, or maybe it was like two gradients, one up and one down. I think that's probably how they did it. Um, but but they were floating in the air. And it was this really cool, like it, it, I felt like that was the, what? I felt like that was the, the core of the idea of Minecraft was, here's this world, it's a toy world, it's isolated spatially, right? Like it's not infinite, it's like, it's bounded. And it's also bounded vertically, right? You can't dig down infinitely and you can't build up infinitely. So it's bounded vertically. And having that floating in the air, like really, really seemed to exemplify the way that the game worked. It, it kind of bound that whole thing together and made it made it function in your, in, in my mind at least, like, like, this is what the game is doing. It wasn't pretending, right? Like it wasn't, when my, when you were playing Minecraft in the Skyblock map in the original alpha, the game wasn't pretending to be something that it wasn't. It was just being exactly what it was, which is a voxel drawing program, more or less, like voxel exploration. So I felt like that was like the core that it should have been built around. It shouldn't have been built around infinite worlds, it shouldn't have been built around multiplayer, it should be built around that. And you can add multiplayer to that, and people do. And there's like a ton of multiplayer maps that are skyblock maps, right? Where there's no ground and you have to like build bridges between islands and stuff. And people have made skyblock mods. But like the core of the game strayed from that and it tried to be something else. And I feel like that was the missed, that was the mark that was missed. Um, so he... Anyway, so there was a skyblock map, but then there was also like island maps and there were, um, what, infinite world maps, but you couldn't go off the edge or like wrapping. I forget if they did wrapping or not. I, I don't think he did wrapping. It, it might have been an option at one point. Anyway, uh, so I was like, I really want to have an island map with a skyblock map above it. And in the map format, in the in the game itself, you could just tell it like how big you wanted the map to be and it would it would only do it horizontally and then the vertical height was limited, I think, to 64 blocks or something. And then you can go into the save file and change the, the height limit, I think. Um, but if you wanted to connect the maps together, uh, let's see. I forget how the data was encoded, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the data was encoded such that the vertical columns were all the vertical was the last, so it was like X and then Y and then Z. Except in Minecraft, I think Y is vertical. Anyway, uh, the, the vertical axis was last, so you could literally just take the chunk of block data and and like append it one to the other. Just take the whole chunk of, of block data from the sky map blob, 
block and then like the whole map or whichever order it was, right? I think maybe it was the island map first and then the sky block map. And you could just like append them together. So just like pull the data out of one map, stick it in the other map, change the number at the top to be double what it was before and you're done. And uh, so that's what I did. So that was like the first, the first script that I wrote, the MC level, what, height man or something. Uh, what is it called? MC Unity. Let's just go to that one and take a look at it. See if it's what I remember. Open file. MC Unity. Test one dot MC level back when the MC level file still existed. Ah, oh, those Halcyon days. Uh, let's see. Merge style adjacent. Yeah, so you could have adjacent stacked collision. <laughs> oh yeah, collision. That was fun. So so stacked. I think. Um, let's see. MC Unity. So this is the the MC level object. This is how it how it grabbed the data. And uh, yeah, it was just tiny because it didn't. It didn't edit the whole file like it it didn't have interface for all the data in the file it just just searched for the the um the info that you wanted unify maps unify dims so you change the dimensions add the dimensions together where's my my actual file modification stuff though collision unity here we go stacked unity so yeah so the out data is just the in data plus the other in data and then uh the out type is just the type plus the other type so so you just add it together and then for for adjacent for adjacent you you'd have to do it separately yeah you can actually choose what version you're playing on and i think you can go all the way back to alpha uh back when they were using the the mc level files and um, yeah, and use these scripts. So I, on the on the page, I have uh, what they work for. So MC level files, I think was in like alpha alpha two or something was the last version that that did that. I don't remember the the details there, but um, but yeah, you can go back and and get a an old version. You just roll it back in the launcher. You go in the launcher, and it's got a little drop down for like what version you want to launch as, and there's like you know the most current tag or like this version or that version and you can just go back to you know like alpha whatever it is the oldest one and um and grab these files and there's still a lot of this stuff in minecraft that that is familiar like it's it's very strange to go back at those old files it's like oh yeah there, there weren't pistons and there weren't like it still had flowing water with water pressure that was the other thing like in the in the com in the infinite worlds you couldn't do water pressure because it would go off the edge of the map and the water pressure would be infinite or the like the source would be infinite and so you had to like change the way that water worked but in the in the limited maps back in alpha it actually had water pressure where like you'd make a hole and like the water would flow in up to the level that you know it would fill stuff up and it would, like the blocks would kind of skitter along the surface it was it was weird and experimental but it was like it was really cool and there was so much promise there anyway so uh yeah so that's mc unity yeah, you should try it out. I mean, all the codes are right here. So this is all just in Python. Um, and there's Collision Unity. So that one just takes the, the data and randomly selects a block from uh, from each map. And then, uh, like, for each block, it chooses one at random from either map. And so you get, like, this weird, like, yeah, it's just like a mishmash of the two levels mashed together. I don't remember how it handled doors. Maybe are, were there doors? Maybe there weren't even doors back in this version. Um. Anyway, I never really did handle like object object entities properly, like block entities or or, or entities of any kind. But um. Hey, Rue, what's up? I'm doing a stream right now. Hi. I'm doing a stream right now. It's kind of cold out there, isn't it? You should go back in the house. I'm out in my office and my little daughter is out in the cold. What's up? Is Leia taking care of you? No. You should go find her and remind her she's supposed to take care of you. Okay. Uh, 
so anyway, so that was the first script that I wrote was was this kind of merge block thing. Yeah, you could add the block values. Oh, I see the block values together. Sure, yeah, you could do that. And just like have it, uh, it'd be a little bit strange because they weren't really in any... The order of the block IDs in Minecraft was entirely determined by the blocks that were added to the game first. So, so there was like stone was actually block number three and cobblestone was block number one, if I remember correctly. Uh, it'll be in one of these files, but... And so, like, if you wanted to make a, a thing that, like, added the blocks together in a sensible way, you could make a, a conversion table where it's like, you know, these two blocks added together make this other block. And that could be kind of cool. Um, yeah, yeah. That would be interesting, though. Just, like, add them together and see what happens. All right. So that's MC Unity. Um, the first thing I wrote. And then... A week or two went by, maybe. Sensible programs are boring. It's true. It's true. A week or two went by, and then, uh, let's see. Well, I can just look at the, the timestamps on these. So MC Unity was the first one I made, and it was the last one, or the first one that I, I stopped updating. And then, uh, let's see, I guess we'll just go back to the story here. Oh, yeah, the Dwarf Fortress thing. So Notch had mentioned on his blog that one of the things he wanted to do... So so at the very beginning of this project, no one, including Notch, knew where the project was going, where Minecraft was going. And so he was just like, oh, there's all this cool stuff I'd like to do, and maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll do that, and I want to try this thing, and I want to try that thing. And um, I feel like... I feel like his, his aspirations got captured by the community, or, or by some weird... by like a the spirit of online multiplayer maybe something something captured the the project and like kind of twisted it into its own thing and so it never really got to where i felt like it should be going like i said earlier i feel like the like the skyblock should have been like one of the core things in minecraft where like these things float in the sky and that explains why there isn't gravity and why things never fall and like that could have been like the core idea um but he decided not to do that. He decided to go instead in the direction of infinite maps. But back when it was still finite, one of the things he said was, I really want to be able to uh, have a scripting language so that, like, or, or, or a modding language or a modding interface or something, like, like a way, an official way of getting mod support, I think was, was what he said. I wanted to support mods officially. So that was one of the things, because people had already started modding stuff, because it's in Java, and so it's not hard to mod. And the other thing he said was, uh, I really want to do integration with Dwarf Fortress, so that you can actually play first person in Dwarf Fortress, because a lot of the stuff in Minecraft and in Dwarf Fortress have similar, there's like a, a very um, tight link between the ideas in them, right? You can build and destroy blocks. Minecraft has voxels. Dwarf Fortress kind of has voxels, although the scale is problematic. Um, but so those things, I was like, oh, that's really cool. I want to be part of that. Like, cause I love Dwarf Fortress. I'd played Dwarf Fortress for years before that. Uh, yeah, for years. And the, so the idea of like, oh, I want to be part of this. I'm going to learn how to mod or not mod, but I'm going to learn how to, to work with the Minecraft save files. And I'm going to start experimenting and like doing stuff so that I can help with this project. Cause that sounds cool. And, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a mermaid farm. Oh, no. <laughs> they, um, so, but, so the idea was that I had was, okay, how would you do a Dwarf Fortress importer to Minecraft? Like, what would that look like? And, uh, and before then, I had also been really interested in doing scripting and, like, making castles, uh, I don't know if, why exactly, but like building castles was a cool thing. And in fact, it turns out that one of my ancestors, my 30, no, it wasn't 30, 20, 25th great grandfather, I think, um, was, oh, what was his name? Look it up on my wall thing. Fulk, F U L K, Fulk the Third, Count of Anjou. And uh, he was the first. 
first? No. He was one of the greatest castle builders, one of the first greatest castle builders. He built like over a hundred castles in, in France, I think, in Eastern or in Western Germany uh, back in the day, you know, hundreds of years ago. So anyway, one of my ancestors was a castle builder and I felt like I wanted to build castles and it was just like something that gripped me. Like Minecraft gripped me, right? And so I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to build castles in Minecraft and I'm going to do it in such a way that the the, the structure, the architecture of the castle building script will also work as a dwarf fortress importer. So uh, what I did was I made this castle script and that is Mountain Fortress, the old Mountain Fortress script. And uh, the idea behind this is that instead of dealing with individual voxels, you would deal with groups of uh, nine voxels. I think it was nine by nine. And that made like a like a larger voxel block. Uh, not as large as a chunk, but like this this larger voxel unit that you could then manipulate to make different shapes. So in the castle sense, I, I had like what? Three, four, three, three basic types of, of these larger voxel units. Uh, and, oh, oh, so so in Minecraft, all right, so we'll go back to our, in Dwarf Fortress, we'll go back to Dwarf Fortress. In Dwarf Fortress, there are voxels, kind of, uh, but the voxels have this, this quality where they can have a floor to them or no floor. And so that's what I did with the castle script is I had this nine by nine voxel block and then it could have a floor on it or no floor. And then I was like, okay, if you were to import a Dwarf Fortress world into Minecraft, it would import each of the each of the squares in Dwarf Fortress as a nine by nine by nine set of voxels in Minecraft. And then you'd put floor blocks in if there was a floor block in the Dwarf Fortress game at that location, and you wouldn't put a floor in if there was no floor. And then if it was solid of some kind, then you just fill the whole block with whatever it was that it was filled with in Dwarf Fortress. And that also worked really well for making castles because castles and, and all buildings really are built out of uh, what are called bays, whereas it's like a, a set of columns going one direction and then an orthogonal set of columns running another direction. And like modern architects will try to fool you by like distorting the grid or by like, you know, um, having a bunch of different sets of connections or like rotating the, the coordinate frame and like overlaying a bunch of stuff on top of each other to try to hide that. But the underlying structure is always the same because that's how the human brain works in that way. And and it's also like three-dimensional space is laid out in such a way that it's complicated. It, gravity, so there's gravity and there's three-dimensional space. And those two things basically mean that you're going to build buildings with bays in them, square bays. So in the castle script, I did the same thing where you've got these nine by nine blocks and then you can just like build the castle with those nine by nine blocks instead of building them with individual voxels. And then when you go to populate it, when you go to transfer the castle to the actual Minecraft world, you ask each block, okay, what type are you? And then, uh, yeah, yeah, gravity. I mean, it's it's really their whole thing, right? Architects have to deal with, that's that's why we have architects is because we have gravity. So if, but they seem to try to want to ignore it, right? And make all these weird like multi-level things. It's like, no, people want level floors for a reason. I, I've got a whole rant on that. But anyway, the uh, so the castle then would, would ask each block, each of these, these voxel groups, what, you know, populate yourself into the map and it would do it. And then you'd end up with a castle. And so the castle is actually built. So that, like these parapets up here are, are not parapet blocks inside the castle. They're parapet blocks outside the castle. So this parapet block is actually over here. You, if you can imagine like a three by three by three block of voxels, and you can see these are three blocks wide, one, two, three. And so it's this block is a voxel, this block is a voxel, this block is a voxel. The same thing with these bays, they're three blocks wide. And if I had been thinking about it, I would have made it so that you could change the size of the voxel blocks so that then they could be different sizes, but I didn't think of that. Anyway, so so these all get built. Uh, so these are all like parapet blocks that exist outside the building. They're actually like hovering above the walls here. And the same thing with these parapets, they're hovering above the walls out here. And then uh, like these ones are, are walls and in Dwarf Fortress, they don't have this where where you've got like sided walls where the walls face a certain direction. Um, but in the script, I, I made it that way because I didn't want blocks 
I didn't want walls that were three blocks thick everywhere because it was like, well, that's not what I want for the castle. Um, but it would have it would have made sense in the door fortress importer. You could just make it import it that way, uh, or or not. You could have it because if it's like a finished wall, there are finished walls in door fortress, and if it's a finished wall, then maybe you'd make it thinner, I don't know, something like that. So that was the castle script, and uh, and that was a lot of fun, like just playing with that. So uh, it had keeps and it had gatehouses and it had doors and stuff, but the whole thing was built on that same three by three voxel block idea. And here's like a staircase in the corner. This is before there were those like half block stairs, so they were like full block stairs. And uh, there's a, a tower over there, and the towers could be the smallest tower you could build was a tower with the exterior walls with the exterior walls instead of the interior walls. And so that it had that nice cut on the corner you can see here, like a cut on the corner there, and you could do that same thing all the way down. So that is the uh, the Mountain Fortress script. And I just, I, I'm kind of want to, I'm kind of curious to see what, what the Minecraft Mountain Fortress script looks like. Because it's been years. It's been over 12 years since I've touched this code. Castle base level, MC level. So these also work on MC level only. And uh, I tried at some point to make an upgrade to it that would work, but I, I lost the um, I lost the thread of, of what was going on. Let's see, MC level. Oh, so this is the MC level class. I eventually split this out. We'll get to that later. But uh, I eventually split this out. But this is the, the same thing where it reads the, the data. And it's a little bit more extensive than the, the MC Unity script. But it's the same idea. And then here's a chord to index thing that allows you to convert XYZ to, um, to coordinate locations in the data block. And in bounds, it just checks to see if if you're trying to build something outside the edge of the map. Because this is the first script that I made that actually modified the the blocks inside the file instead of just like taking all the blocks themselves and, and manipulating them as an entire block. So if you're trying to build a castle right on the edge of the map, you need some way to check if it was off the edge of the map. Uh, there's a search columns thing that shows up again a lot of times later. Uh, random surface points, that's a, a thing that that grabs a bunch of points. The reason I wanted that was so that I could build the castle on the surface instead of having to remember or having to input the the specific location that you wanted the castle, like X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, so you just had to import the X, Z, or tell it the X, Z, and then it would find the Y value for you. I was like, ooh, this is really smart. I was like, well, yeah, of course. I, what I should have done is taken the player position so you can just like stand where you want the thing to be and then run the script and it'll do it off your player position. But I didn't do that. In fact, no, no, I did do that eventually, but it was years, I mean, it was only like maybe less than a year ago that I added that functionality to the newer stuff. Distance to material. So this basically searches along a vector, a three space vector um, for a specific material type, a specific material index. And I think the material index can't be a list of does not equal mat index. Yeah, okay, so in this case it was just a single mat index, but it'd be easy to change it. I think in other places I changed it to a list of, of mat indexes in the in the tree script. Um, highest point finds the highest point with that mat index. And uh, def block solid. Okay, so and see even the titles DF block. So that's Dwarf Fortress block. Uh, solid Dwarf Fortress block. So it's got width, length, and height of three. And then the wall mat is uh, whatever the wall material is. And it checks to see if there are other walls around it. Okay. So it's checking the other, the other castle blocks. Well, that's smart. Floor. And then you've got a, a block that's a solid block. So this is subscripting or subtyping, subclassing, child classing, um, whatever the object oriented thing where you make a child class of another class. So this is a, a solid block, but instead of, uh, oh, I see get materials, a thing that generates the blocks. So it'll, if wall number is none, then return its own number of walls. Yeah stairs up and down so this is just this is just a map right this is this is just uh you want air here so so in my level editor i think i 
forget what negative one does. I think negative one uses the wall material. So you could set the wall material for the whole castle. And then, uh, so negative one was like the, the magic number for just use whatever wall material you were using for the castle. And then zero is air. 50 is a torch, I believe. And this is before they had, um, there was data for torch orientation. So I think it was always pre-generated. Or maybe there were data. I forget if there was a data, a block of data data and a block of block data or not. But uh, anyway, in either case, I didn't mess with it here. And then you get the material where the stairs are. So this is just the mat map. And then it uses the, the mat map um, and offsets it by the, the location to get the, the index of the block that you need. So this is just like a little tiny template basically for make some stairs. And I don't think I rotated it. Self dot flip. Oh no, I did. Kind of. Width negative. I just inverted the width value. That's kind of smart. Huh. Stare up, stare down. So this is the same idea. Uh, except that the y value in this case is, is greater than zero. And this place it equals zero. Stare down, get material. Hmm, I don't know exactly what's happening here. Like I said, it's been 12 years and this is not well documented. Huh, block ramp. Okay, so this was I see, I see, I see. Stair up, down. Because in Dwarf Fortress, there's a stair that goes up and down. There's a stair that just goes up and there's a stair that just goes down. And so I made a, a separate class of, of classes. I made a separate class for each one of these. And so then if it was a stair up, then for all the Y values above zero inside the current block, it would do the stairs up, but it wouldn't do the stairs down. It would just use whatever fill blocks you were using. And likewise, for the for the stairs down, it just made the hole in the floor for the stairs down and didn't make the stairs up. Uh, it would return zero, which is just air. So yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. It's smart. So it's just a mask, basically. It masks off the stairs up or down if you just got those one. And then the base file is the stairs that go both up and down. Cool. So uh, then there was a ramp because there are ramps in Dwarf Fortress. But I don't think I got these to work. Yeah, it's just, it just returns zero or material. If X equals Y, return material. Okay, so it was just doing like a real, a real straight ramp, but it will only go to the right, I guess. Oh yeah, ascending to the right. And uh, so yeah, I, I never got those working properly, but that should have been something like uh, marching cubes kind of thing because that's kind of what Dwarf Fortress does for uh, for for that stuff it does marching cubes only top down I don't think it does marching cubes on the bottom although it could there's no reason why it shouldn't like at the top of a cave or whatever it could like curve it over but you, you never climb up to the underside of the roof on the top of a cave and, and need a ramp right if you're climbing the walls you don't it's only you only really need ramps for Wagons, I think. Anyway. Uh, Dwarf Fortress blocks. Set up. So this sets up the block list. Assign blocks. Gives it a value. Make sure it's not outside the, the map bounds. Exterior walls. Okay. Take a coordinate make exterior walls. On the sides where interior walls are specified for the indicated block. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I've got like a special case where you can have interior walls in the building, but they are masked off if there's an exterior wall there. Tower has a bunch of exterior walls. Place an entrance. Class tower. So you've got an entrance. Then you place the entrance at the best location. So it's, it's doing a bunch of checks to make sure that you don't place a door in the middle of a hill. Um, what stairwell? Yeah, so it does all this stuff. 
I probably shouldn't go through all this code. Gonna bore poor Tim here. Create. Is there anything else interesting in here? I've basically gone over how this all works. Highest point of solid stone, place the fortress. Did it check the whole map? Maybe it did. Add fort. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I had it place like a number, a random number of watchtowers around the map and then put a fortress on the highest point of the map, which would usually be in the center, uh, I guess, probably. And then you can make it different sizes and, uh, and export it. And none of this was easy to use. It was all just modifying these, these values here. So like the size, the number of towers was, was, uh, the size of the towers was right here. And the number of towers was watch tower count. Oh, maybe that was modifiable. Is that up here at the top? Ah, yeah, I started doing some, some stuff. I guess I was always doing this stuff, but fort size auto, watch tower count, prime material, the wall stuff are made of, secondary materials, the floors, doors. They did have doors at the time think 17 17 dirt I think 17 is dirt interior doors made of wood slope multiplier why is it p-l-y-e-r I can't spell guys all right so that's mountain fortress so that was the second script I made I wanted to make a dwarf fortress importer uh, I wanted to be like, I want to be part of the project. So uh, I made that and then 319, that was around the same time that I was working on the Forrester script, which is like the big money script that I ended up, I mean, it wasn't big money, but it was the, the big script that I ended up making. Uh, merging maps, yeah, so that was the first thing I did that. And or maybe it wasn't the first thing I did. This seems to indicate that I made the castles first instead of the, the map merger thing. Maybe I did. It was all around the same time. I was kind of working on all this at once. The starting house. Yeah, yeah. Trees. So this is the tree script. And uh, the tree script was the one that I kind of got that took off but the castles and the dwarf fortress importer were always kind of like what i really cared about i guess um but the tree thing so there used to be just these little popsicle trees i don't even know if there's a picture of them i guess uh, no those are all there these these things it used to be just these little these little trees and interestingly when i got the 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 script working and implemented in java um Notch ran some, some uh, instrumentation on it and some tests and found that my script for making the big trees was almost as fast as his script for making the little tiny trees. So like they took it the same amount of time. And I think the reason is because his script was generating a random number for each piece of foliage all the way up to the top and like this, this, this chunk here, like this whole thing, the whole volume. And it was like doing a bunch of complicated calculations for each block of, of the foliage. Um, and mine didn't do that. Mine, mine only ran a few, a few calculations, a few random number calculations, and most of it was deterministic. So let's take a look at that. Those were, they turned out really well. I'm still happy with how they look. I'm still happy with how it turned out. So it used to be back in the day that um, the foliage would decay regardless of like all over the whole map, regardless of whether there was, whether it had been generated by the map or whether it had been modified by the prairie or anything. There wasn't a, a flag. Yeah, Procgen, I know, right? Yeah, yeah, so that's the other thing that I feel like Notch kind of lost, he lost the, the thread on was, I should take this text down. No one wants to see my head covered up with that or the title bar or whatever, uh, was that there was so much, pro there was so much, promise in proc gen and i feel like it wasn't exposed to the player so even in dwarf fortress you can go in there and like well 
Yeah, Dwarf Fortress 2, really. Dwarf Fortress 2 has this, has this, like, deep betrayal where there are so many cool tools that the game uses to generate the world, but they aren't exposed to the player to allow the player to manipulate the world. Uh, so, like, the only procedural tool that you have in Minecraft that you can manipulate as a player... Is this right? Yeah, to my knowledge, the only procedural tool you have in, in Minecraft that you can manipulate as a player is growing trees. And you can't even decide what kind of tree is grown in the case of the, the popsicle stick versus the oak trees, right? The, the large oak trees versus the small oak trees. You have to just kind of like place it down and destroy it a number of times until you get the big ones. Um, and you can, you know, you can do the jungle trees and you can do the, uh, what, the pine trees in Minecraft. Um, but you can't really manipulate them. Even then, you can't manipulate how tall they're going to be and what type they're going to be, right? Like, you use the different saplings, but you can't, like... You can't use the tools. You can just kind of like poke the tools into the world. And even then, it's just the trees, right? You can't do terrain generation. You can't do um, town generation. It's got a whole set of tools for generating towns. The game generates a town. Why can't you generate a town? Like you should be, that should be a, a mechanic in the game to generate towns. Uh, it's got mines, right? Why can't you generate a mine? It's got the whole, you know, all the mine carts and like the shafts and all that, you know, all that stuff. Like, why can't you use those tools? It drives me mad. So I wanted to be able to use, I wanted, first of all, to be able to play in the game with big trees because I wanted to build tree forts and you can't build a tree fort in these dumb little popsicle trees. These are too small. They're too small for a tree. So that was like my, my, my driving force behind making these big trees was I want to build a tree that's big enough that I can build a tree fort in it. And uh, so the way the script works is pretty straightforward. It um, checks the ground to see where to place the tree. It uh, generates a height. And I think it checks all the blocks vertically to make sure that there's nothing in the way when the tree's growing. And then it uh, generates some, some random locations for the foliage clusters. And then it checks from each of those foliage clusters back to the trunk in kind of like a diagonal based on the, the type of tree and stuff, like what angle that goes at. But checks all those blocks to make sure there's nothing in the way of those. And if there is, I think it deletes the foliage cluster. And then um, that's basically it. And then it just generates all that stuff. And I'm not going to go full depth into this uh, bone mealing grass blocks. Oh yeah, yeah. You can make you can make little um, little flowers. That's true. That's true, Tim. You can make um, you can generate flowers by putting bone meal on grass. You can generate like flowers and little grass and like lilies and stuff, which also is cool. Um, yeah. So bone meal is basically the only proc gen tool you have as a player in Minecraft. So um, yeah. So it it generates that stuff, and I'm not going to go through all the details of how this all works, but I do want to talk about the core of the tree script which is i'm just going to download this and open it up bring it over here the core of the script so so in this one i've got a lot more variables for stuff that i've added over the years and uh things but if we go down here a little ways normal tree bamboo tree distance to material yep 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 make roots make trunk somewhere in here is the round tree cone tree plant trees process trees oh yeah another thing i do is i, I generate all the foliage first and then i generate all the wood because that way i don't have to think about where the wood is going to go when i generate the foliage i just generate the foliage and then i overwrite on top of it with all the pieces of wood uh, so that you never get like foliage taking chunks out of the wood. Works pretty well. You get a little bit of overlap in, in generation, but not much. Uh, let's see. Normal tree, bamboo tree, procedural tree, cross section. Here we go. So this is the is the heart of the tree script. And it basically makes a, well, you can read it, creates a round section of type mat index in the map. So you tell it the mat index you want, uh, you give it the map file, 
which isn't the actual file. It's it's like an interface file um, or an interface object, I guess. And then you tell it the center, which is just a, an XYZ location. You tell it the radius, which is how big you want it to be. Obviously the radius of the, of the circle. And then you give it the direction axis. And the direction axis is the axis along which um, the section is made perpendicular to. So one is Y, zero is X, and, and uh, two is Z, I think. And so this, this is probably not very smart, but I, I love how this turned out and how I, how I did this. So I'm just gonna walk through this because this is like, this basically generates everything. So if you look at, uh, let's see, if you look at the trees, you can see like each of the foliage clusters is like a bunch of circles stacked on top of each other, different radii. The whole trunk is itself uh, a bunch of circles stacked on top of each other, different radii. And then each of the blocks in the branches are actually also circles uh, only going in the direction that the branch is going. So yes, this is where the magic happens. So that is the, that's the whole thing. They're just a bunch of, of sections of circles that are gen, then like layered on top of each other to make, you know, these shapes. And there's very little overlap because the, anyway, yeah, there's very little overlap. So it's, it's pretty efficient in terms of, of actually generating the, the stuff. Uh, so what it does is it's got the radius. It adds 0.618 to the radius because if you've got a radius of one or two, if you've got a radius of two, it needs to have a little bit of extra to fill out the corners, basically. Um, so just like the way that you'd normally think about drawing a circle, the, the circle, when you voxelize it, the circle that you're actually drawing is larger than the circle that you intend to draw. And so I found that 0.618 works well. It's also the, like the golden ratio or the, the integer uh, additive inverse of the golden ratio that, uh, that that works really well for making the circles look good. So that's what it does. First it adds the radius or it adds a, a little a little bit to the radius to get the rad. If the rad is less than zero then don't do anything because you didn't want to do anything in, in the first place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, they, the circles don't, they don't come out perfect. It's actually kind of, it's kind of cool how, how it turns out, but, um, and so then it's got section index. So these save the index of the section. So if the direction axis minus one mod three is section index one and plus one mod three is section two. So this basically offsets the direction axis by one in each direction mods it by three so it stays within the zero to two bounds. And then that gives you the other two indices that aren't the direction that you want it to be perpendicular to. So if you imagine that you've got like a section along the uh, X, Y plane, then you're gonna say Z is the direction axis, Z is the primary direction it's heading in, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's perpendicular to. And so then X and Y are the other two. So you take Z, Z is two, add one to two, it's three, mod three, it's zero, that's X. Uh, two minus one is one, one mod three is one, and so that's why. Uh, and then if it's zero and it's minus one, that's minus one mod three is two. So it, it all wraps around properly. So it gets the other two indices. It sets a coordinate for zero, and then it does an offset. So for offset in range radius from negative radius to radius plus one. Uh, oh, and it makes this an, in oh, I see, it makes this an integer. Rad. Rad is the, does it still use radius? This distance greater than radius. Okay, so it doesn't, it doesn't actually throw away radius. It just sets rad, which is the, um, the integer range for, for getting the, for doing these, these little loops. So it does two offset loops, one for the section index one and one for section index two. And you'll see that in a moment here. So uh, offset minus rad to rad plus one. So that just gives you the a loop that goes from negative radius to positive radius, basically, but it integers and, and so that the bounds work out. And then we set the distance, which is the square root of the absolute value of the offset one, which is this one, plus a half. 
uh, squared plus offset two, which is this inner loop plus a half squared. And so those halves are the things that make it so that the circles are, are pretty round. And then if the distance is greater than radius, then continue. So it just loops around, it just checks every block in that thing. And if I wanted to be, um, if I wanted to be clever, I could, instead of doing this for the whole range from negative one to one, or you know, negative radius to positive radius, I could do it for a quarter of the circle and then mirror the whole thing. Uh, that'll be clever. I'm not that clever, apparently, <laughs> but, but that would be clever. I think I do that in the, in the, um, the crater script, the, the star stone script, but I don't do that here. So I set the radius. Uh, if it's greater than the radius, I continue. Otherwise, I, I set the, um, I get the coordinates for this location. So the primary is the direction axis, is the direction axis uh, index of the center location. The secondary one is the secondary index item in the list of the center vector. Right, so this is this is like this is where the magic happens because it doesn't care whether it's x or y or z. All it does is says, okay, what's our primary value? We've got that one. We'll pull that one out of the out of the vector of this center vector, and and we're just going to maintain that one because it doesn't. We're not going to change that. You know, moving the the section. It's just a two D section basically of, of voxels, and then it adds an offset one to the secondary one and adds offset two to the secondary two. And those are also of these secondary index one and secondary index two. And then the coordinate of this, so this is why this initialized, this initialized at zero. It doesn't matter what these integers are, they could be anything. But you need a coordinate to plug the values into. So now it takes that coordinate and it clobbers it with the primary, secondary one, and secondary two values in those specific slots of the coordinate. Now we have a coordinate that's populated, and then we assign that value of the coordinate values 0, 1, and 2 to be the mat index that we wanted this to be. So like I said, if I was cleverer, then uh, I would just loop through this once from uh, from 0 to rad plus 1 and 0 to rad plus 1 and then mirror the whole thing so that you just get that value and then you take this and set the offset to negative instead of positive and, and you'd be done. Um, but I wasn't that smart at the time or I didn't know what I was doing or, or I was just that lazy. Uh, so the, yeah, so that's the cross section. That's the cross section thing. Very happy with that, with how that all works. Because then you can take, uh, let's see, tapered cylinder. So you can make a tapered cylinder and the tapered cylinder just calls this function a bunch of times. It just calls cross section inside this loop. And it just takes this thing and, and maps it from one end to the other and changes the radius based on the, the range value, the primary offset the primary offset as the primary distance and then the radius equals the interpolation of the end size and the start size by the uh, distance you are along the primary axis. Uh, so that makes the rest of everything where you're not just calling this directly then you're calling that in tapered cylinder. So tapered cylinder does all the branches and the trunk and the the roots too. Don't forget the roots because these things have roots in them. It's so fun. Uh, so none of the trees have roots except for the trees that I coded, uh, but not to turn them off because he didn't want roots interfering with caves and things, which I think was the obvious thing to do, but he didn't want it. And that's fine. It's his game. So uh, let's see. That is the tree script. So there's a bunch of stuff. And I also added some other functions. Let's just go back to this briefly. Uh, you can make the trees hollow. So you can tell it to have a, a broken trunk, hollow trunk. Uh, you can change all the density and all the stuff. You can have hanging roots so the roots go out until they find air and then they hang straight down. Um, you can add root buttresses, like those big um, root buttresses. Look them up. You know what they are. And uh, yeah, so only in forests you can have it replace, replace trees that are already there. So there's a bunch of functionality in here. Forester. So I wrote that script, and it wasn't in this exact final form, but I, you know, wrote enough to get this kind of thing, and uh, communicated with Notch a little bit. So I was on the forums. Oh, let's let's go to the forums. So here is the new script. That's oh, got this advertisement. I don't want advertisements on my stream. Come on. 
Um, it's not going to let me get away without advertising for McDonald's. Add huge trees to your scripts. So this is the new thread. The old thread uh, is no longer accessible. It's It's been lost to internet rot and link rot. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. But this was made around the same time. And I think like the forums changed to another host or something like that. And so like all the old forum stuff was poured over into the new forums. But then when they changed again, all the old, old forum stuff just got culled. And all you're left with is the newer forum stuff. Um, so all this stuff, uh, yes, I usually make this stuff. I don't understand Python. I'm helping people, uh, I love the script. Um, let's see. So there's some people in here asking about, can you make, yeah. So Mike is making a mod for better foliage or something. And this comes back to my, my disillusionment with the way that Minecraft was going and uh, why it was not what I wanted or n not what I wanted to be involved in or something. So um, Notch had said, like I said earlier, I want to make this so that it can be moddable. I want to like, have mod support and I want to make it so that uh, it has integration with or some kind of inter interaction with Dwarf Fortress. And I was like, yes, because like Dwarf Fortress is the existing king of proc gen and like having this tool to be able to get into it first person and modify stuff and then maybe at some point export that back into Dwarf Fortress would just be it'd just be incredible. So like I want to be part of that. And so this was also part of that thing where like I want to be, you know, like I'm making tools to to like make this game better. And um so when I first made this, I was like, hey, you know, this is really cool and you can you can modify your map files and uh people were like, "Hey, why don't you make a mod?" Like could this be combined with Greater Greenery, the mod that Mike is working on? Um, and I was like, yeah, I, I'm, I've am i been in contact with Mike. I don't think I ever heard from him again after this point, but, you know. Uh, but I'm not going to make a mod right now. Like, this is just a map editing tool. And the reason I didn't want to make a mod is because I knew, which is what happened to, like, tons and tons of, of people uh, over the years, tons of modders, is that... Yeah, the beauty of this is that it isn't a mod. Okay, well, yeah, whatever. Like, I agree, but, you know. Uh, the the thing that happened to so many modders over the years is that they would invest a bunch of effort into getting this kind of kludgy, weird mod working, and it would do a cool thing, and then there would be an increment in the Minecraft version, and they would have to do a ton of work to bring their mod up to date for the next version. And so eventually when 1.13 came around and, and changed the map save format and a bunch of other stuff, uh, a ton of the modders were like, well, I'm just going to stick with 1.12. Like, why would I, why would I waste all this effort again to, to get updates? So yeah, mass appeal. Well, mass appeal kind of won out. I mean, a lot of, like I said, a lot of the people stuck with 1.12 and a lot of the mods are, I think on one point, uh, what was the other version? 1.12 nine or 1.8 i think was another mod like a, a kind of like a a fork of minecraft more or less where like a lot of mods stuck with 1.8 or it left a lot of mods behind and in one sense it's kind of good that a lot of those mods got called because they were garbage or like the best ideas for those mods were pulled into the next version because they were the only ones that people were excited about enough to actually care to keep updated but for me, and I think for a lot of other people who might have made cool things in Minecraft, cool mods in Minecraft, um, we weren't willing to, or I wasn't, I'll just speak for myself, I wasn't willing to invest the energy knowing that I was going to be uh, asked to reinvest that energy over and over and over again for no reason, right? Because like, there's no reason that I should have to change my code because there's an update in the code in Minecraft. There should be. A mod interface <laughs> and, and so like yes I understand sometimes the interface will have to change and you'll have to update a few things but like this is like the whole code base would shift around or they'd refactor a bunch of stuff and like the way that Minecraft worked like got rewritten and so I was just like I could see oh 
this is going to exhaust me and then I'm not going to want to work on this anymore and then I'm going to abandon this thing that I wanted to do. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to not invest in, in sabotaging my own creative process and just do the thing that I know that I can control, which is the scripting stuff. <sighs> Having a stable API is a good thing? What? Yes, yes, that is what I am suggesting. Yeah, yeah, 1.12 modding golden age, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, I would have loved to make mods for Minecraft, but I could not bring myself to invest the energy knowing that I was going to be undercut in my efforts. That my efforts weren't going to be honored, I guess, by the, by the game itself. That the game was always going to treat me... Well, and the other thing was, I, I was uh, extending the... what ended up being false hope, but I think still... Um, charitable assumption that Notch would keep his promise to the community that he would create a stable modding API. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to wait until that happens, and then I will do some modding. I'm going to tab away from this because advertisements are annoying. Um, so I never I never ended up doing modding for that. I'm just going to go briefly on to here. This is my fandom, minecraft.fandom.com page. Uh, you can get a couple links. Here's the link, another link. If you don't want to go to mc.triapp.com, you can go to this link here, which just takes you to the same place. And uh, then here is the archive.org post of Notch's blog showing a screenshot of these big trees, April 8th. So I was working on this in March, and then uh, right around the beginning of April, I got in contact with Notch. And I said, hey, I... Uh, I didn't say I'm not going to make a mod because you said that you were going to make an API and so I'm waiting for that. I just said, hey, I made this script. Uh, I'd be willing to, to do some work for you to integrate it into the game. Do you Are you interested in that? And he basically said yes. Uh, but there was some weird stuff with Notch and so I want to talk about that too. And um, like first off, I just want to say again, like I don't have anything against the guy. He was doing the best that I think that he could. Uh, turns out that the best that he could wasn't what I thought that he should be able to do. But, you know, that's that's not up to me to decide, and, and I don't really know what else was going on in his life. I do know that there were some things, um, there's some drama with his wife. I believe when Minecraft started taking off, he uh, married one of the ladies from the forums, and she, or she was, I forget if she was a mod before on the forums or not, uh, but he he married this lady, and then a couple months later, I think, they broke up and got divorced. And so there was a lot of personal drama happening. And, and like having Minecraft blow up in such a big way was also like a very strange psychic load on him, I think. Um, he's not a, a, a religious person, so he didn't really have a community of faith to fall back on. So this was kind of like he's this, this atheist that has suddenly been elevated to the position of a digital god. And he didn't really know how to handle that. Uh, because I don't think anyone does or can. And um, so there was a lot of stuff happening in his life. And I'm not saying that that uh, any of that justifies the way he behaved professionally. I'm just saying that I'm aware that, that there was a lot of stress. He was under a lot of stress. And so uh, what I'm going to go into has that subtext of like, hey, there's reasons why these things happen. But um, I was like, hey, I want to work on this and like, in order for me to make the code consonant with your code, I would like to see the code that you use to generate the trees in Minecraft, and then I will write a I will write a piece of code that does what my code does, but in the kind of formatting and, and stuff that you would like. Um, and he declined to do that. He was like, no, I don't want to give you access to my code. Why don't you just write a, a Java uh, class that will do what you're code is supposed to do and give it to me and then I'll work on integrating it into the game. And I felt that that was a little bit strange. It was like, why are you holding on to this? Like, people are already modding the game. Uh, people have already reverse compiled your code. It's not like you've got some sort of state secret that you're protecting. It's not like you've got, like, this huge complex thing that you've somehow invented. Like, this is not a complicated idea. And, and I'm asking for for a little bit of your I mean because I guess the 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 counter argument would be if I give you this code then I will lose the ability to control it and it won't be mine anymore it'll belong to the internet 
or someone else might take it and and find a, a security exploit in Minecraft somehow and like so <laughs> take advantage of it and exploit it. I don't know. I and this also gets back into my difference with uh, most of the creative world about intellectual property. I believe that intellectual property is um, what a foolish arrogance and and stupid nonsense, uh, dangerous dangerous nonsense. It's it's really poisonous. The idea of the idea of intellectual property is a poison of the mind, and so I I don't want anything to do with it. And so it baffles me every time someone makes an argument based on the idea that's like, oh, well, this is a really good thing, right? And so I feel like maybe that's where he was coming from. It's like, oh, well, this is my intellectual property. It's a really good thing that I'm keeping control over it. It's like, no, I don't agree. But again, nobody asked me. Uh, so so he declined to give me any of the code that, you know, that I could use as a template to work off of. But he did say, here's the interface. You know, it, it should return this kind of value and it should have this kind of, uh, this kind of template or, you know, I don't think he even gave me a base class, but it was like, it should return these things and, and like here are the conditions under which it will be run. Uh, I need to give it a seed, like a random seed, and then you need to take that random seed and and generate a number off of it. Don't modify the seed itself. And um, what else? Uh, it's the bound conditions. It couldn't be more than 16 blocks in any direction. And, um, and that was a little bit weird to me because like it should be able to be really tall, but he didn't want it to be more than 16 blocks tall either and uh, didn't want the roots. So anyway, so I worked within the constraints that he gave me. Uh, I learned Java. I, I knew nothing about Java at the time. So I taught myself Java and converted my script from Python to Java and tested it and uh, sent it to him eh, over the course of about a week. I think it was about a week of work that I, that I committed to that. And at the time, I don't, mm, I don't remember. I don't think I was working full time at the time. Um, this is before I got my full-time engineering job, so anyway. Yeah, good luck, Tim. I got some Minecraft tree generation code. Yeah, well, at the time, I was I was one of the kids. Like, I, was, I wasn't, I was like, yeah, it was 12 years ago. I was 26. I just turned 26. So they... Uh, and so he and he used it and here's a screenshot of of the the trees that he was he put into the infinite world generator and um so that is the story basically how i worked with notch he he paid me over paypal i think and uh and that was the end of our basically the end of our interaction he asked me like can you help with the do you have any ideas for the the cave generator because i want to make this infinite world cave generator work with the oceans and that also came back to this this kind of difference of creative vision between him and I, where I wanted this to be this proc gen thing that you could that you could really interact with and use as a tool, and uh, and he wanted it to be something else. I don't think he really had a clear vision of what he wanted it to be because there's a lot of horror elements he tried to add to it, especially at the beginning. He was talking about like, oh, this is gonna make it really spooky. This is gonna make it really scary. Like, there's a lot of tension and suspense. And, um, and I was like, I don't, like, that doesn't really appeal to me. I don't want it to be a horror game. Um, and then there's like, oh, well, there's all this multiplayer. It's going to like, people really like multiplayer. And so we're going to add like infinite worlds and multiplayer to the game. And I was like, okay, but I don't really care that much about multiplayer. Like I, I would prefer to just have my own map and then I can like give it to people and they can play with it and like change it however they want or whatever. And then like we can swap map files back and forth or something that was the kind of multiplayer that i was interested in um and then again like with the world like the infinite world it's like okay well if we've got infinite world and it runs into the you've got a cave system and it's in like going along based on this perlin noise i think he was using and then it runs into an ocean at some point but the ocean hasn't been generated off the edge of the map because the whole world hasn't been generated yet then you could run into a situation where the uh, the cave ends up flooding from the other end as you're exploring when it should have been flooded already. And so I don't want any of that stuff to happen. I want it to all be pre-baked in. So eventually he solved that problem with water, like only going 16 blocks or whatever, like like petering off or whatever as it flows down hills and stuff. And uh, and you still get a little bit of problems as you're exploring, if I'm not mistaken, um, with like water, and especially lava, because lava flows so much slower. So... So he didn't have that that um, that creative vision of like, 
the way that I would have done it is I would have generated the map. If you recall from, from what I was saying earlier, with these, these castles, I was dealing with larger block sizes that I would manipulate and then populate once you once it the save file needed the data but if you're working in the game itself there's no reason why you couldn't generate a, a whole chunk let's say and not populate the chunk just like this chunk is basically ocean this chunk is basically mountain or whatever and that's eventually what they did with the biomes i think each chunk has a biome flag or like some biome uh values or something that that tells the game what kind of biomes are there uses it for map generation but there's no reason why you couldn't just generate the whole map you know like a thousand times larger just at the chunk level and then where the player is or near where the player is you start populating down at the individual block level and so that's what i would have done it would have been like okay well this whole area is caves and this whole area is ocean and so we'll we'll just flag all those chunks at like the chunk level the world gen you know when you're generating the blocks and then you wouldn't have a problem with generating caves block by block out to the edge of an ocean and finally it floods back in and you could also do water pressure that way you could be like okay well this here's the water level in this area you could have like a big lake that's up high at the chunk level where you're dealing with these chunks and eventually they did in the in the world um the world save file they split the chunks the chunks were vertical sections 16 by 16 vertical sections and then they split them those off into 16 block high i think they're called sections now um and so those are basically these big blocks that you can that you can move around in the save file if you want um and i'd like to do some i'd like to play with that at some point i haven't quite got the save file editor working with version 1.13 files yet but I'm getting close uh i haven't really been working actively on it because nobody really uses this stuff people want to do mods instead like tim said you know mods kind of won out um but like the way that i would have approached it is at that level and then like if you wanted to generate a gargantuan tree you could just say well there's a tree here at the you know at the chunk section level of detail and then as you got closer to it you could populate it in but when it was off in the distance you could just render it even as you know just like these humongous blocks and it doesn't matter like it doesn't matter that it it will pop in at some point because like it's minecraft <laughs> It's all voxelized. There's no reason why you couldn't have these larger scale blocks. And then once you're thinking in that way, it makes a lot of sense to be like, okay, well, you've got these these individual blocks and then you've got chunks that are made up of 16 by 16 by 16 voxels of these things. And then you just have larger scale, a larger scale data structure that in, in the map, I think it's called um, a map zone or something, or maybe a map section. Um, and they're like 64 by 64 chunks but they're still limited in height because the height of the chunks was limited at the time. But there's no reason why you couldn't just make a, that voxelized, right? And have this 3D volume sparsely populated of these chunk sized blocks that then get amalgamated into even larger, you know, uh, zones or, or, or biomes maybe, or whatever, right? Whatever you want to call it. And then you could have the whole volume that way, uh, expanding out in three dimensions instead of just two dimensions because there's no reason why it should be fixed to a plane like this is a computer game and in my mind at least like we should try be trying to get back to the sky block thing right where instead of having this this dense uh densely populated filled in thing all the way down to bedrock that you can't go past it should be a a, a volume of blocks that extend in three dimensions in all directions and if you want to make it infinite fine uh, but you don't have to and and or you could make it uh, become more and more sparse as you get toward the edges so that yes it's technically infinite but there's nothing out there uh or whatever right there's so many there's so many things you could do with this idea and and no one is playing with them so anyway i still think that we could uh be doing a lot more to explore this idea of of uh, voxel subdivision and and uh procedural generation and stuff but anyway so i i was kind of pushing in that direction and um, I think that at around that same time, I think he went on a, a vacation to Hawaii or something. And um, I stopped hearing from him. And so that's kind of the end of my story of working with Notch. But it's not the end of my story of scripting because I ended up doing a few more things. Uh, let's see, merging maps, trees, city groundwork. I was uh, making a script to generate cities. It would lay out like a grid and then it could generate 
uh, cities based on the same block idea as the castle script. And uh, so you could generally have, like towers and multi-story buildings and stuff. And I had uh, torches in these little lamps so that the whole thing would be lit up so that you wouldn't get mobs generating and spawning all over the place. Um, and then craters. So this is what, something that else that I wanted to play with. Um, so one of the forum guys sent me a, a IM or, or a, a private message, a PM, that I should make a script with boulders and meteors. And I was like, that is cool. And so I used the same slice idea as the, uh, as the tree, that section idea. And I just used it to make blocks and then I used it to excavate, uh, craters, uh, working a ridge around the craters. Oh, working with notch. I guess it was around, it was after that. I don't know. And then uh, he talked about generating villages, and so I made this really simple script that generated huts um, that were just, you know, sod walls with a, a wooden roof and a door in one side. And um, I said that to him. I was like, hey, this, here's an example of, you know, what you might want to try. And uh, again, heard nothing back from him. And then Coral, I made these things. They were just out of white wool, but... Um, this was years before they added coral. I, I don't even know if there is a coral voxel in Minecraft now. I know they added some coral stuff. I think maybe there is. Maybe there's a coral block. Um, but I did some, some experiments with coral. And uh, then there was a bit of a break. And so, so that was basically the end of my interaction with Notch. Uh, he was... I think burnt out, overwhelmed, and heading in a different creative direction than I was. And uh, he also never returned my emails. So, so once we had finished working on the on the tree stuff, that was basically the end of my interaction with him. I think I got one more or a couple more emails back from him asking about like building villages and um, if I had any ideas for building villages and caves and stuff. And I kind of I gave him some ideas, but never heard back from him. And so that, like that was the end of our of our correspondence. And, um, and so that's kind of sad. And I've gone over some of the ideas that, that I have for where I feel like Minecraft should have gone. But, um, I mean, in the end, he's a billionaire and I'm not. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm still happily married and he's not. So, I mean, it's not like it's a competition. And it would have been great if... I feel like it would have been great if um, we would, it would have been able to, to work together more. Uh, that would have been cool. But... I also understand that he had his own his own ideas and, and like I said, his ideas worked. Uh, whether or not they worked better than my ideas, no one will ever know. But this is the uh, the Starstone thing. So this was a, uh, a an addition to the, so this is a Starstone before it was doing displacement. It just basically carved out a chunk of the ground and and just deleted it. And then I wrote some um, some really simple code. <coughs> Excuse me, some really simple code to to dig into the ground and then instead of just deleting the blocks it would do a little bit of um i don't think it even did like a, a parabolic trajectory or anything it just like took the block displaced it outward and set it down on top of the ground and so that's what this is doing and uh then i made flying mountains which is kind of my attempt to like push back in the direction of of like the sky world kind of map area and um and that was fun. Again, you know, pretty simple stuff. It just basically uh, steps out in the direction, in all directions over the landscape, um, marks off an area, and then based on the number of steps outward it took, plus some random values, it digs down and grabs that whole thing, moves it upward, and then replaces the ground underneath it with air. And uh, so that's what that does. It's Wizard Mountain. And uh, you can see here, there's the roots. In this case, it's a birch tree, and so it has birch tree wood roots. But... Um, but those are hanging roots that are hanging down below the, the edge of the world. And then here is a here's a gargantuan crater, just as a demonstration of, of the Starstone script. And you can see in the cross section here where the surface is uh, has been deformed like this. And it doesn't actually do a deformation, but it turned out that the way I was I, I tuned the way that it was moving the block so that this kind of thing would happen where the blocks that are nearby but are also near the edge of the crater don't get thrown as far as the stuff in the middle. So the stuff in the middle ends up way out here on the edges and the stuff right on the edges only gets moved a little bit. And so as a result, this whole, right this edge here 
gets this really cool uh, geological looking kind of scarf where it uh, where it kind of gets deformed like that. I thought that was just this <laughs> is really cool. It was really sweet way that that, that worked. Um, and you can see that there was a desert over here, and so like these blocks have more sand in them because it's actually grabbing each block and moving it to the correct location. It takes a really long time, a lot, not really long, but like you know, maybe up to a minute for a, a block or for a section this big. And there's no parallelization, which I could add, but uh, who has time? So anyway, so that's Starstone, another script that I that I worked on. And then the last one was once he added minecarts, I was like, oh well, I should make a script for making roads. And uh, so I made one that makes powered minecart rails. And you can build tunnels and bridges. And I think I've got slopes in there too at some point. I'm not sure. And then uh, there was a guy, Code Warrior, was uh, was making MC Edit. And I, I don't know if MC Edit still exists. I think it still does. I don't know if it's supported or if it works on the latest version or not. But um, I integrated, uh, I worked with him to make a little, uh, a little what, wrapper that would wrap the... The script so that it would run in in uh, MC Edit, so you can run all these scripts or not all of them, but but the main ones in uh, MC Edit as well with a GUI interface and you know modify the stuff and, and change the size of things and uh, that was pretty fun. So that works pretty well. And I have no idea how many people have used this over the years in MC Edit. I don't know how many people use MC Edit either, but um, that's kind of that's kind of the end of the story until I uploaded all this stuff on. GitHub. So uh, so now all this stuff is on GitHub, and I started playing with getting the 1.18 map imported, and the difference, you don't need to go into the details, but the difference basically is that the, uh, the, what, the uh, data in a basic Minecraft file, how I was saying earlier, is stored as, as index values for the blocks themselves. And in a 1.18 map format and above, oh yeah, yeah, so 1.18 is the one. 1.13 is where they change the Anvil format. And I do have it working with 1.13. 1.18 is where they change so that you have um, basically a hash table, an index table of the block IDs. And so now, instead of having like whole chunk of data that's got binary data that's got like block 0000 is air and block 0001 is cobblestone and 0002 is grass block and 0003 is dirt and so forth um it's got a little table that says what those indices mean and then it's got the block of data but so it's different for each section i think it might be each chunk it's certainly by each chunk and it might also be by each section, which is a 16 block high as well as 16 wide and square. So that way you can have uh, basically an infinite number of block types as long as you don't have more than uh, 10, 24 blocks in each, different types of blocks in each section. So if for like mods that have a whole bunch of type of different blocks, um, you can get around having clashes in the ID table because it used to be that you'd run out of ID indices for each block type and then each map file could only have a certain number of mods or mods that had a certain number of blocks in them. Um, and then this way with the save format in, in the 1.18 map format, uh, you can do it per chunk. So you could have like you know, a factory with a bunch of factory blocks in it and then you've got like over here is a farm with a bunch of different farm blocks in it. You can have like different types of block for different types of plants or whatever, and as long as you don't like mash those together too much, you won't have any conflicts. And I think there's an added ID hash table format that allows you to extend that so that it's technically impossible to run out of blocks because the number of blocks in a section is smaller than or equal to the number of ID table entries that you can use. Um, so basically, it future proofs it so that people can have a whole bunch of mods running at once and they won't clash with each other because you're not going to run out of ID indices in the map. Um, and what would happen before is like if you were running a mod and then you ran a different mod on the same save file, those ID indices might mean something different. And so then you had like meta mods that would arbitrate between the mods and like assign different ID values. It was a mess. It was a mess. It was a nightmare. So um, so this was a great idea as far as like providing mod support. And, and frankly, you know, 
if they're still working in the direction of having a formal modding interface, which because Microsoft owns it now, I kind of doubt, but uh, if they were doing that, then this would be a great step forward in that direction. Um, it's of course like 12 years too late because the modding, the modding community has for the largest, large part moved on from Minecraft to other things. But um, it's still, it was a good idea. But as a result, it broke the, um, the scripts that I'm using. But I'm, uh, I've got it working now where I can read the data files and it wouldn't be hard to, to update it so that it would write them as well. Except that now we're at the point where in addition to having felt it unworth the effort of getting into modding because the game is changing, I'm also feeling that it's not really worth it getting into the map editing script thing because the map file format itself keeps changing and uh, it's at least changing faster than my will to update it. So. I haven't updated it yet. I've gotten kind of like halfway through getting it to 1.18. I can read all the, the data out of the maps now and I understand the, the section format and I've got it all in there. I just don't have anything for modifying the um, the data table itself and the you know the data and adding blocks back in. But um, like I said, it wouldn't be hard, but I just, I don't feel like it's worth the effort, especially since I don't know if anyone really uses these anymore. So um, we'll see, I guess. And again, this is all on, on uh, GitHub. So if you want to play with this stuff, make a fork of it, you're more than welcome to. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm completely opposed to the ideas of intellectual property in all its forms. So all this stuff is released to the public domain for anyone to use for any purpose, commercial or personal, and uh, with or without attribution, no restrictions. So that is the story of how I worked with Notch, why I did it, what I was hoping out of Minecraft, why I was disappointed with Minecraft and um, kind of a little bit of where I would hope it to go in the future. I suppose the last piece in this whole thing would be uh, projectfledgling.com, which is a blog that I put together again years ago, although I've updated it a little bit more recently um, with ideas about game design and stuff and in here is uplift block scale nesting which is um my proposal that i outlined earlier about having chunks within chunks basically that i feel like would solve a lot of the problems in that uh, people are facing in in uh, this proc gen space but that is yeah nested scales and ideas of uh all kinds of ideas for well, not all kinds, but a number of ideas. Uh, some ideas for why the scale factors would exist and um, or what scale factors would exist and things like that. So if you're interested, you can go to blog.projectfledgling.com and I think there's a link from my personal website which you can get to from Triop, which is linking to here, which is the Minecraft story thing. If you go down to the bottom back to Peripheral Arbor, then it'll take you back to my personal website and from there you can go to video games and read about uh, blog, gaming blog, that's projectfledgling.com. So link for Project Fledgling in the video description. Yes, I will do that. Uh, I'll put a link to blog.projectfledgling.com in there and uh, you guys can read it. This is one of my favorite things that I made on that blog, but I'm not going to go into it because that is for another stream. So thank you everybody for joining me. Thank you, Tim, especially since you've been here the whole time. And I think maybe you're the only person who's, who's watched this. And uh, again, mc.triop.com for basically all this stuff or links to it and uh yeah thanks for sticking with me uh i guess i'll i can stick around for a bit and take questions or whatever uh tim you got any other questions i'll put a i'll put a link to that in the in the video description uh links to all these things um yeah is there any other is there any other stuff you want to talk about I'll give you a, a minute or two to respond here i know you've been working i am technically working too but it's a slow day. I didn't have any any uh, meetings on my agenda, so I was able to do this. Project Fledgling, yep. Put a link in there. All right. Well, it looks like that's it. Thanks for joining me, Tim. Thank you, everybody else who watches this. I hope you enjoy, and... Uh, have a good day. Oh, the only real question I have is whether you'd have checked out some of the other voxel gen projects. 
like Valoran or Mind Test. Yes, I have played both of them. I've played Mind Test. I played Valoran. Valoran is it's kind of weird because it uses voxels for the graphics, but it doesn't really seem to commit to the idea of voxels in themselves. Um, and it's also just kind of like scales down the size of the voxels in order to get higher resolution, which is kind of the opposite of what I feel like needs to be done. Like you need to have a, a hierarchy of voxel sizes in order to really get the kind of proc gen stuff. Cause you could, oh man, I should do a whole stream about like each of these games, each of, each of these games and like the idea behind them fledgling stuff. Cause uplift is uplift is this thing here. And, uh, Oh wait, is this thing here? Uplift is this thing here, and it's just like one part of this whole this whole idea that I've got that my my master giant project. But yes, I have heard of and played Valoran and Mind Test, and uh, they're cool, but they don't seem to have a, a vision of their own. Um, well, Valoran does, but Valoran's more like if I remember correctly, and I could be remembering the wrong game, but isn't Valoran the one that's like um, kind of like World of Warcraft, where it's like a multiplayer? uh mmo kind of thing and you can like run around and there can be other players and there's like npcs that do stuff and like they spawn in enemy villages and you can go and like conquer an enemy village and you respawn all, all all the time and you can run around and explore um i may have done a stream of valoran at one point if it's the one i'm thinking of if not i've certainly played it uh if it's the one i'm thinking of then i played it yes it's got like gliders it's got um is that the one with gliders yeah, it's coded in Rust. Yeah, I think it's the one, it's got gliders like in um, Breath of the Wild. So it's kind of like trying to be a mixture between Breath of the Wild and World of Warcraft and Minecraft. Um, but it doesn't really lean into the voxel. It doesn't really lean into exposing tools to players. Uh, voxel manipulation. The voxel manipulation is very, very slow in Valoran, if it's the one that I'm recalling. Um, it's basically just like an overlay, a voxel overlay on top of uh a, you know basic noise height map generation stuff it doesn't if i recall correctly it doesn't really even have much overhang i guess there are some caves yeah i think there are some caves in there i could do a playthrough i could just stream some valoran that'd be kind of fun um but yeah it doesn't it's it's uh i don't feel like it's really <coughs> excuse me my, my voice is giving out i've been streaming too long i don't th feel like valoran really commits to the advantages that voxel that voxel interaction allows um i haven't seen a game that that does it better than minecraft and that's kind of sad in my opinion but you know I, the one thing i say to the kids is that back in the day we had windows paint and minecraft is basically like 3d windows paint like you manipulate one voxel at a time uh, you don't have any procedural tools it is basically it's even worse than than paint in many ways unless you're playing in creative mode and you've got some tools for like fill and clone and stuff but it's it's a very very basic like 3d windows paint program kind of thing and it's got a little bit of simulation on top of that so yeah um and i feel like we could be doing way better with with voxel stuff but you know Maybe people don't want better, and, and that's fine. It's just entertainment. So I uh, I entertain myself thinking about this stuff. And uh, hopefully hopefully we'll get there someday. Anyway. Yep, thanks for joining me, Tim. Yeah, I have checked out some of the other stuff, and uh, yeah, they're, they're cool. Uh, Mind Test is basically just like a clone of Minecraft, but in some other language, I, I forget even what they wrote it in. And it's, you know, snappy and responsive, but it's it's not like uh, it isn't doing anything interesting that, you know, the Minecraft isn't doing, or it doesn't seem to be. So, yeah, thanks. It's morning here. As you can see, the, the morning light's coming in. I started streaming, streaming before dawn, or almost before dawn. So you have a good evening, Tim. And uh, to everyone else who ends up watching this, hope you have a good evening, too.